right. We're going to uh, go into communion now. Um, just a reminder that this does happen on the first Sunday of every month. Um, communion is not something that you just wander into. Communion is something that you should be preparing for. At least that's what the text says. You should be examining yourself. Um, and I will give you a chance to do that just in case you're surprised by communion today. But this really is the day that we get to remember, obviously, what the Lord has done for us. And I want to see him someday, and I probably will have to crawl toward him to say thank you for the cross, but we do need to remember him as he commanded us to. Um, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11, if you want to turn there. I'll read it, and then I'll give you a chance uh, for some prayer, and then we will pray together. <clears throat> We're going to do, we're going to start in verse 22. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and, a blood of, and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink the cup. Whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And this is why many, many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned with the world. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instructions about the other matters whenever I come. So it's a good day for self-examination. This is between you and the Lord. It is a good time and a good moment to take here and not take this cup in an unworthy manner. If there's something between you and a brother, if there's something between you and your spouse, if there's something that you need to deal with, if there's something that you should be dealing with with the Father, you should do that. You should not take this cup in an unworthy manner. The judgment that... Uh, I just read to you, you don't want that on your head. I was reading several other places this week about how we're going to be judged the way we judge others. We're going to be judged the way we judge others. How about we just take a few minutes and judge ourselves here for a minute? Let's examine our own lives. I'll give you a minute to pray silently, and then we will pass the cup. And wait, I'm going to ask you if you would help me with it, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you today, I pray that we would do so having rightly discerned our own situation, God. Pray that we would judge ourselves rightly, God, that we would be wise, God. Give us wisdom to discern what is right and what is wrong, what is, what is in our lives that needs to come out of our lives, God. We want to follow you. We want to follow after your holiness. We want to be sanctified by you, God. And we know that that just like every good father, that comes with discipline, God. And I pray that this would be a church that disciplines itself and that you are working on all the time. God, we know that we cannot earn any, any bit of salvation. 
but we want to remember you. We want to remember your life. We want to remember what you did for us in your death and in your resurrection, God, and then we want to live like we remember it every day. God, if there is sin in this church, God, I pray that you would bring it to the light. I pray that you would bring it out so that people here have to deal with it. God, it's better than it being hidden. If there are strongholds that are keeping people back from doing things that you would have them do, God, I pray that you would eliminate them. God, for my own life, I pray that you would forgive my sin. For those things, those people that I have hurt, for everyone that I have wronged, for where I've neglected my life with you, God, I, I pray for forgiveness there, God. And I just, I stand in awe when I think about what you've done for us and that you even allow us to take breath. God, your grace and your mercy and your love for us is, it goes beyond imagining. And God, we, we thank you now for your body and blood and as we take communion, God, I pray that each heart, each mind would be focused on you and we were remembering what they should remember in your name. Amen. Wayne, would you come up and help me pass this? <clears throat> All right, Wayne's going to come up now. He's going to be uh, bringing God's word to us for the next two weeks, and then I'll be preaching the two weeks after that, just so you know that schedule. And I just want to take a second and pray for him before he comes up, and then he'll bring us the word, okay? 
One more time, let's go to the Word and go to the Lord in prayer. God, we thank you for Wayne. Thank you for his family. Thank you for what they're celebrating uh, this week, God, and all the hard work that went into that. Thank you for all the work that's gone into uh, bringing this message, and, and thank you for his willingness to do that, and thank you that he's with us, God. We thank you that he's uh, recovering from his surgery, God. We just thank you for him and what his family means to this church, and now please give him clarity of mind, give him strength uh, as it brings your word, and um, we thank you, and give us open minds, open hearts to receive it. In your name, amen. Wayne, please come. Good morning. All right. Um, so I remember, I remember when I first had gotten saved, or right before I'd gotten saved, and going through the scriptures, I'd uh, have some really difficult times with some things that I read. And praise God, I had people in the, my life that knew uh, way more than the Bible than I did. And thank God that uh, they were willing to answer my questions and be patient with me. And uh, one thing I can remember is, is uh, not reading all of the story of Abraham and his son. And I remember like saying, why did God like tell this guy to like kill his kid? And then I'm thinking that he still went, had gone through with it. And uh, of course, uh, not having read all of the scripture and just walking away with that thought, um, praise God, I had a family member who I had mentioned that to, and he says, oh, you got to read the rest of the story where God puts a stop to it, you know, and then provides for him the, the ram tied up in the bushes. Um, and another thing for me that was difficult when I first had gotten saved was, uh, how did a whale swallow a person? Right? So I was actually really, I was kind of, I was very confused. And I remember asking the Lord, and I said, Lord, you know, I love you. I believe your word and all that kind of stuff. And I'm having a really hard time with a whale swallowing a person. And um, of course, except for that cartoon role that we all remember with Jiminy Cricket. But, um, anyways, I uh, had prayed to the Lord, and I said to him, Lord, I'm having a hard time with that. And within a month, I went from like believing him. Uh, it's almost as like I asked him to say, Lord, help my unbelief. And he really helped my unbelief. And I was just like, wow. I couldn't believe how much I actually believed God's word and that it was the case. And then, of course, he led me to a, like a modern day story when uh, a guy named Bart Bartley or Bartlett was uh, swallowed by a whale as well. And he was cut out of the stomach. And, you know, he was completely bleached from head to toe. But he lived a, he lived a, 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 a normal life until the end of his life. Um, and then, of course... The one that really got me with God's word was uh, the words of Christ. So when I first got saved, I was on fire for the Lord. I was at work sharing the gospel, and I was getting in trouble. I was getting pulled in, into office by sergeant after sergeant after sergeant, getting pulled in the office by captains and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so why I said that is because I was just on fire for the Lord, and I did not care about losing my job, um, especially at first. And... Uh, but in the midst of being in love with the Lord, I came across some of his, some of his words, some of the words in red. And uh, they said to me, unless you love your father, mother, sister, or brother, or your children more than me, you're not worthy to be my disciple. And that, ooh, wow, that really, that really got me. Because if you would have asked me before that, what does God want you to do? Does he want you to love, love him more, love your family more, or whatever? I would have said, he can handle me loving my family more. That's, of course, what he would want me to do, right? And, um, but when I came across that, even in the midst of being in love with Christ, I was so frustrated because, and I actually respectfully shook my hand. I remember as I was heading out to my garage where I, where I used to pray, and I shook my hand respectfully and said, how do you expect me to do that? And, uh, of course, I went to prayer, and I said, Lord, <laughs> if I... I'm finally at a point where I can't do this. I, I don't even know how to do that. I don't even know, wouldn't even know where to start with loving you first before loving my, before loving my family. But having uh, called out to him and admitting that, yeah, I actually cannot do that, and that's a really hard saying, um, but I know that uh, obedience is what you require of me, and obedience to the gospel, especially to the words in red, um, is what you require of, of all of us. And, um, of course, it was through that that the Lord had helped me 
uh, love him more than my family. But in doing that, I end up realizing that I end up loving my family 10 times more, or 100 times more, or 1,000 times more than I could have by actually obeying that portion and allowing God in my life to do that. So um, the reason I had said that, because today's message is from the red words in the gospel according to Matthew. And if anyone doesn't know, the red words in the Bible, in a lot of Bibles, are the actual words of Jesus Christ. So um, again, I had said that because a lot of his words are actually very difficult. So when I go through them today, um, just uh, accept them and receive them. And, uh, but of course, go into the scripture yourself and double check them and double check them and uh, make sure you under, know the context and everything from, from, which they can, from which they came. But do your best not to try to ex- explain to yourself why, it's, why you don't have to follow those, those instructions. Uh, do your best to actually read God's word and say, how does this apply to me? So, all right, let's get right into it. Uh, let's pray first. Father God, Lord, we, we love you so much. And uh, we, we thank you for all that you do for us. Father, we thank you so much for your son. Again, we thank you so much that it is finished and that it is done. And uh, all the work was performed for us on the cross. Father, we thank you that uh, our requirement is to believe. Our requirement is to obey your son. And uh, of course, um, he and you and the Holy Spirit is who provides that salvation for us. So we thank you for adopting us into the family. We thank you so much for the words of your son, Jesus Christ, in which is life, Father, in which is life. And I know myself that I've come across them and they've been very difficult for me and a lot of them still are very difficult for me, Lord God, but help us to to receive them and help them to become a part of our lives and help us us to walk um, in obedience to you, to your son, and uh, to his apostles, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20a. In the New King James Version says, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. It's that verse 20 that really inspired this message. It says, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So I pulled from the words in red, Jesus' words from the book of Matthew, and summarized his words into commandment form. The sermon reads like the Proverbs going from thought to thought. It's important for you to go to the book of Matthew and find the context of these sayings and see how they apply to you. I managed to make it through chapter 19, but do your best on your own with the help of others, especially the Holy Spirit, to master the commands of Christ in your own life so you can obey the command to teach others to observe all that he has commanded the earliest disciples and you. In chapter 3, Jesus says, It is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. In chapter 4, we are instructed to put the Bible before our bellies, not to test God through reckless living. We are to reject Satan and worship only the Lord our God. We are to repent and preach repentance follow Christ, and become fishers of mankind. In chapter 5, we must be blessed. We are to be poor in spirit. People who mourn and are meek. We are to be hungry and thirsty for righteousness, merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers, and persecuted for the sake of righteousness. We are to be reviled, persecuted, and falsely accused 
for the sake of Jesus and rejoice and be exceedingly glad when it happens. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. Do not hide your light. Instead, let it shine in public and everywhere you go. Do not break the least of these commandments and then teach others to do the same. Instead, do these commandments and teach others to do them as well. Your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. You must not be angry with your Christian sibling without a godly cause. Neither shall you insult them or even call them a fool. If any member of the body of Christ from any church has anything against you, then go, ask for forgiveness, and be reconciled to that person before you offer any gift to God. You shall not look at others with lust. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. If your right hand causes you to sin, chop it off. With the exception for the reason of sexual immorality, you shall not divorce your wife. Neither shall you marry a divorced woman. Do not take oaths. Only let your yes be yes and your no, no. If someone slaps you on the right cheek, then present the left cheek to them as well. If anyone wants to sue you for a certain amount, then give them that amount, and then more than that. If anyone has the authority to order you to go with them one mile, go with them two miles. Give to everyone who asks from you, and don't turn anyone away who wants to borrow something. You must love your enemies. Bless everyone who curses you. Do good to everyone who hates you. And pray for everyone who spitefully uses you and persecutes you. You must be perfect. Chapter 6. Do your charitable deeds in private and commit to praying in secret. Use the Our Father as a template for your prayers. You must forgive others. Not if, but when you fast, don't appear miserable. Instead, look presentable and put a smile on your face. Do not store up treasures on earth. Instead, commit to storing up treasures in heaven. Use your eyes as instruments of purity and righteousness. Worship and serve God, not money, not wealth, and not material possessions. Stop stressing out over food, water, and clothing. Instead, make seeking the kingdom of God and his righteousness first priority in your everyday lives. Chapter 7. Be mindful when you judge, knowing that the sword of judgment cuts equally in both directions. Make no attempt to remove specks from other eyes before you remove the logs from your own. Constantly ask God, constantly seek God, and constantly knock on God's door. Treat everyone the way you want to be treated. Enter in at the narrow gate. Keep an eye out for wolves 
disguised as sheep. False prophets who are like poisonous trees, bearing deadly fruit filled with false doctrine and ungodly actions. We must all depart from lawlessness and commit to doing God's will. As a wise man builds his house upon a rock, so must every phrase of our Savior be the performance of our daily lives. Chapter 8. Jesus touched and cleansed lepers, and so should we. Jesus healed the paralyzed and pointed out when people had great faith, and so should we. Jesus said he had no place to lay his head. Would you follow Jesus into homelessness? If Jesus said, let's go, I'm leaving. And meanwhile, your loved one who's in hospice or their funeral is tomorrow, would you stay back or would you follow? Will you choose faith or fear when the winds and waves of despair seem to be too much? When the demon-possessed men come out of the tombs, be filled with Christ's courage, compassion, and power, stand up to the legion to the very last hour, and to the swine they must go where they thought they would flourish, but into the sea they went, that's where they did perish. Chapter 9. For those of you in this room or listening elsewhere, if your names are registered in heaven, be of good cheer, regardless of your physical condition, because your sins are forgiven. Even though Jesus has the power to raise the dead, heal paralytics and cleanse lepers, etc., his primary objective was, and still is, to extend his power in heaven and on earth to forgive sins to those who want it. If you are not born again, please realize that every portion of your being is riddled with the sins of Adam and your own sins, and your only hope for heaven and escaping hell is a full-time relationship with Dr. Jesus who paid for your eternal healing on the cross with his own blood. You are to pray for more gospel preachers and more disciple makers to hit the streets and the nations. Chapter 10. Go, find some lost sheep. Preach the gospel. Heal the sick. Cleanse lepers. Raise the dead and cast out demons. Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off on Judgment Day than the householder city that rejects your efforts to save them. Be wise as serpents and gentle like doves. You will get arrested and be beaten. Your worst enemies will be your siblings and parents. Endure to the end, and you'll be saved. Fear God only because he is the only one who can kill the body and destroy the soul in hell. Whoever confesses Christ in front of others, he will confess their name in front of his Father. If you deny Christ, he will deny you. You must love Jesus more than your parents and children. You must embrace your cross, follow Christ, and lose your life for his sake. Chapter 11. You must not be offended because of Jesus. It will be better for Tyre, Sidon, and Sodom than for all the impenitent cities who've had great Christ-ordained works performed in them. All of you who labor and are heavy laden must go to Christ, 
Take his yoke upon yourself and learn from, his, and learn from him, finding rest for your souls. Chapter 12. Jesus is greater than the temple and is Lord of all, including the Sabbath. People are far more important than animals. It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath, even if it means working, especially healing. If you are not with Christ, then you are against him. If you do not gather with Christ, you will be scattered. Blasphemy and speaking against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. We will be judged for every idle word we speak. The words we use will either justify us or condemn us. The generation that is cleansed from its unclean spirits must be vigilant to embrace Christ and his word, lest they be open to the demon who left, and seven, worse than itself, returning and becoming worse off than they were at first. Your real brothers, sisters, and mothers are the true members of the body of Christ. Those who are genuinely doing the will of God, that is your true family. Chapter 13. In the parable of the sower, you are to be the good ground hearer of God's word and bear much fruit, at least 30-fold, if not 60 or 100. You are to have ears that can hear and eyes that can see. You are to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven because it has been given to you. Do not let your hearts grow dull. Do not become hard of hearing God's word. Keep your eyes open. Stay repentant. And by the graces of God, stay healed. Pray for understanding. Cling tightly to Christ when you experience tribulation and persecution because of God's word. Do not get wrapped up in the thorns of the cares of this world. Beware of being deceived by wealth and riches. And be sure to maintain a spirit-led, fruit-filled lifestyle. Be mindful of the tears amongst the wheat, the false Christians growing up alongside the real ones. You can't earn salvation, but you have to become willing to trade everything for it and sell everything to purchase it. The dragnet of God's judgment could come today, so be sure you are one of the born-again fish and not wood for the fire. When you've done everything to save your family, friends, neighbors, co-workers, and countrymen by pointing them directly towards Jesus, do not be surprised when your efforts come with a lot of rejection. Don't forget that a prophet should not expect honor in his own home, hometown, or country. Just move on to your next location. Chapter 14, Jesus fed thousands of people with enough food to barely feed a small family. So give him everything you have to help others and watch him multiply your tiny offering. In life, trade your fears for good cheers because Jesus is closer than you think. When you ask Jesus permission to go to where he is, and he says to you, come, then walk by faith and not by sight. Be not afraid of obstacles like boisterous winds. Finish the mission and do not doubt. Chapter 15. Be mindful not to make any commandments of God of no effect by the keeping of any tradition that comes in conflict with it. Be certain that your heart is not far from God. Do not worship him in vain. 
neither teach commandments of men as doctrine. Be far more concerned about what comes out of your mouth than what goes in it. As a Gentile, if you requested healing for a loved one and Jesus ignored you and said he was sent to the lost sheep of Israel, would you accept that and walk away? Or would you stay and worship and then ask again? When you ask again, again, and he compares you to the Israelites, he calls them children, and you, a little dog, do you get offended and walk away? Or embrace his description of you and stick around and say, yes, Lord, yet even little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Chapter 16. Jesus wants you to be able to discern the signs of the times. Become familiar with and beware of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you don't know that, then ask God in heaven to reveal that to you. If you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men, then you are an offense to Christ, and he demands you get behind him. You might even hear him call you Satan, as he called Peter Satan. If you desire to follow Jesus, you must deny yourself and take up your cross first. The only way you will find your life is if you lose it first for Christ. Your soul is worth far more than everything and anything this world has to offer, even if you could gain it all. Chapter 17. If you've made the mistake of giving the devotion that belongs to Christ alone, to Elijah and Moses as well, and when God in heaven rebukes you, and you are afraid as you should be, then wait for the gentle, restoring touch of Jesus on your shoulder as he says to you, Arise and do not be afraid. Now that Jesus is risen from the dead, tell everyone everything from the Gospels. The scribes were saying that Elijah must come first, but Jesus made it clear that he already did in the form of John the Baptist. A faithless incident took place, and Jesus wasn't happy. He asked out loud, how much longer should he spend with this faithless, faithless and perverse generation? Nevertheless, he stayed all the way till he died for them, and then hung out after his resurrection until his ascension. So how much more should we sinners have patience with the people around us both saved and unsaved. Jesus said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. However, without prayer and fasting, you cannot cast out certain types of demons. And finally in this chapter, Jesus says, pay your taxes, even if you have a good reason not to. Chapter 18. You must be converted and become like little children to enter the kingdom of heaven. If you want to be the greatest, you must humble yourself as a little child. Whoever accepts a little child in the name of Jesus accepts Jesus himself. It would be better for a person to tie a big anchor around their neck and drown in a deep body of water than to cause a little child who believes in Jesus to sin. Again, if your hand, foot, or eye causes you to sin, chop it off or pluck it out. It's better to go to heaven with one of each than to hell with any body part missing. Warning. 
Warning, be extra mindful not to despise a little child. Jesus left the comfort of heaven and came to earth to save lost souls. God is willing that no one should perish. If your brother sins against you, go to him one-on-one. And if he repents, great. But if not, then bring a second or a third Christian. And if he still refuses, then tell the whole church. If he refuses to repent, then treat him like you would an unbeliever. Love him, but don't trust him. You must forgive your fellow Christians up to 70 times, seven times in one day. If you do not forgive, you will not be forgiven. Chapter 19. A man, when he gets married, must leave his mother and father and cling to his wife, and you must not separate what God has joined. A man is guilty of adultery when he divorces his wife for any other reason except fornication and then marries another woman. A man is also guilty of adultery when he marries a divorced woman. If you are able to accept becoming a eunuch for the kingdom of heaven's sake, then accept it. Do not stop children from going to Christ. Only God is morally perfect. You shall not murder or commit adultery or bear false witness. You shall honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. If you want to be perfect, then go, sell everything you have, and give the proceeds to the poor and go follow Jesus. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than it is for rich people entering the kingdom of God. It's impossible for anyone to get saved without God. Whoever has followed Christ will sit with him on a throne and judge alongside him. If you leave your houses or siblings or parents or wife or children or lands for Jesus, you will receive a hundred times more than what you gave up along with your inheritance of eternal life. Let's pray. God the Father, Lord, we love you. And of course, your son also said, if we love him, that we should keep his commandments. Father God, help us to be like the Bereans. Help us to be more noble than the Thessalonians and double-check the scriptures, double-check Every, every bit of preaching that takes place from this pulpit, Lord God, because each one of us will have to stand before you someday, Lord Jesus. So please help us to take the responsibility into our own hands, trusting you, getting to know you better through your word. Help us to obey. Help us to live that abundant life of obeying your scripture, Father God. Help us to love what you have in store for us, when our hearts stop beating and these bodies fail. Father God, help us to look forward to what you have in store for us in heaven, Lord Jesus, and help us to invite and bring as many with us as we possibly can. Help us to train ourselves to be godly and encourage others to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen.